In the late 16th century, a group of English settlers landed on Roanoke Island, ready to start a new life in the New World. But soon they all vanished without a trace. Poof, gone. So, where did they go? Welcome back, friend, to Hometown History. And in today's episode, we're going to try to solve a mystery. The mystery of the lost colony of Roanoke. Let's rewind. The Roanoke colony was an attempt by Sir Walter Raleigh to establish the first ever permanent English settlement in America. Yes, Raleigh, as in Raleigh, North Carolina. The initial attempt to establish a colony in Virginia was successful, mainly because of a military-centric plan led by Sir Walter Raleigh. Then, in the year 1587, a second voyage was set in motion, where a group of 120 people started their journey from the shores of England, bound for Roanoke Island, situated along the coast that would eventually become North Carolina. And leading this ambitious group was the governor of the new 1857 Roanoke Settlement, John White, a man skilled not only in exploration, but also in the arts. But this journey wasn't exactly smooth sailing. The boat arrived at the island around July, and in the initial weeks on Roanoke Island, the settlers found themselves encountering some problems with the people native to the region. These encounters, though small, added a layer of difficulty to their new settlement. As days turned into weeks, the settlers found themselves facing a dangerous problem, the lack of vital supplies. They needed more food, tools, and people to support them. And so, faced with the desperate pleas of his fellow colonists, John White made his way back to England. He left the colonists, including his own daughter, in search of the provisions that could sustain their existence in this new world. But the colonists and White were expecting this journey to be a simple one. Reach England, pick up supplies, and head right back. That was the plan, anyway. As White set off, the colonists were filled with hope that their leader would return with the things they needed for survival. Waiting and wondering, three years went by, just like that. It wasn't White's fault, though, because England had its fair share of chaos happening at the time. The country was in the grip of tensions, and the threat of the Spanish Armada was upon the nation. To top it all off, John White had some issues of his own. The ship that he was on struggled to lift its anchor, leading to significant injuries among the crew during the effort. Their return to England was further delayed by unpredictable and weak winds, followed by a northeast storm, resulting in starvation and scurvy deaths among the sailors. On October 16, 1587, the crew finally reached Smurwick on the west coast of Ireland so White could make his journey down to Southampton. Upon his return to England, he found that Queen Elizabeth I had recently implemented a ban on all ship departures because of the threat of the Spanish Armada, which, despite its reputation for being unbeatable, was eventually defeated. Adding to the troubles, White also encountered delays in obtaining necessary supplies for the colonists. The bureaucratic process and general uncertainty of the times made White feel as if the universe was conspiring against him. In an attempt to help Roanoke in early 1588, White finally managed to obtain two small sailing ships, called the Brave and the Roe. Since neither of them was intended for combat, they were available to sail to the new colony in America. And because these weren't fit for combat... When the ships were attacked by French pirates, absolutely nothing could be done to defend the people or the supplies. And this bombardment forced White and his crew to return to England 
empty-handed. At this point, White felt misfortune was his constant companion. It had been a little over a year now, and his colony was surely on the edge. Back in Roanoke, the colonists had a daunting task ahead of them. To sustain themselves, using an already low supply of necessities for no one knows how long. Months turned into years, and there was no word from John White or Sir Walter Raleigh. How much longer could they go on like this? It wasn't until March 1590, around three years after his departure, that White finally set out, fully equipped, for Roanoke. The threat of the Spanish invasion was gone, and Sir Walter Raleigh managed to arrange a rescue mission for the abandoned Roanoke colony, sending the ships Hopewell and Moonlight on their voyage. The journey back to Roanoke was no picnic, because White's voyage was filled with privateering actions and naval engagements, which delayed his arrival even further. Once they reached the Outer Banks, adverse weather and treacherous currents made the landing extremely difficult, resulting in the loss of seven sailors. Now, White was a realistic man, and he didn't exactly expect to be greeted with open arms. He knew the numbers on the island would be significantly lesser than how he left them. But what he saw, no one could have prepared him for. Governor White set foot on Roanoke Island on August 18, 1590, on the third birthday of his darling granddaughter. When White left, there were 117 people on the island. And now, there wasn't even one. The island had been abandoned. No trace of the settlers, or of any struggle. Nothing. It would have been one thing to find that the people had succumbed to the harsh conditions that they were in, but they had just disappeared, almost as if they were never even there. The only thing left behind was a message. As White explored the deserted area, Trying to figure out what happened, a mysterious sign caught his attention. Carved into a fence post was the word Croatoan, and nearby the same word was carved into a tree, S-C-R-O. As simple and vague as these words were, they were the only remnants of the lost colony of Roanoke. These carvings might have meant the colony managed to relocate and find refuge in a nearby Croatoan island which was named after a local Native American tribe. More importantly, the absence of a Maltese cross symbol, which would have indicated a departure under duress, gave White a glimmer of hope that maybe his family was still safe. White knew that his next destination would be Croatoan Island, which was just south of Roanoke, and he had his ships. But it seems, once again, the universe wasn't on his side. White's attempts to sail to Croatoan Island were ruined by storms on two occasions. The ships had already lost three anchors and couldn't afford to lose another. So ultimately, he had to return to England on October 24, 1590. He died just three years later, in 1593 never learning what happened to his daughter, granddaughter, and the other colonists. In a final letter to the British writer, Richard Hacklut, he wrote that he hands their fate to the merciful help of the Almighty. This failure was possibly the greatest regret of White's career. But the mystery remains. What happened? In the years following this, Many other attempts were made to uncover the truth about what happened in those three years. Sir Walter Raleigh was obsessed with locating the missing colony and worked on the case between 1595 and 1602. But it's also possible that his motives were not out of concern, but drive to maintain his claim on Virginia. Raleigh's voyages included a 1595 transatlantic journey where he claimed to be searching for the lost colonists. 
Later in 1602, he founded an expedition to the Outer Banks to resume the search. But this mission was hindered by bad weather, putting an end to any attempts for the rest of the year. So, another attempt to uncover the truth happened in 1603, when Bartholomew Gilbert led an expedition to find the Roanoke colonists. Unfortunately, bad weather and a tragic encounter with Native Americans led to the failure of this mission. Maybe no one was ever meant to know what happened to them. By 1609, rumors reached England that the Roanoke colonists had been massacred. William Strachey, arriving in Jamestown in 1610, provided an account suggesting that the colonists had peacefully coexisted with the tribe beyond Powhatan territory for 20 years. Strachey's narrative introduced more elements of tragedy and survival, claiming that seven English individuals had escaped the attack and lived under the protection of a chieftain named Ayanoko. After that, multiple investigations were held into this disappearance, but none of them were conclusive. No one really knew what happened, and no one had ever heard from those colonists. Of course, the internet loves a good conspiracy theory. And since this mysterious incident, a number of theories about the lost colony have been proposed. Some are observations based on the basis of the facts available. Others are just conspiracy theories, which is common when something strange like this happens. One of the most prominent theories surrounding the fate of the lost colonists was that they tried to relocate to their original destination in Chesapeake Bay. This theory was proposed by David Beers Quinn and is rooted in the analysis of known facts surrounding the case. He speculated that the colonists simply could not wait any longer because supplies were low and would end soon enough. So they used smaller boats to move to the Chesapeake Bay. But some colonists would have stayed at Croatoan, intending to guide White whenever he returned. But since White was not able to locate anyone, Quinn suggested that maybe the majority integrated with the Chesapeans, while those at Croatoan blended into the Croatoan tribe. This was making some sense, but there was one problem. Quinn's theories relied on accounts told by William Strachey, so all of this could have been speculation at best. During this time, another prevailing theory emerged. Basically, the colonists might have assimilated into nearby Native American tribes. They waited and eventually lost faith in white. So they gradually adopted the Algonquian lifestyle, discarding their European supplies and cultural elements just to survive. It was a pretty bold theory, and many people did not seem to accept it. But there was some basis to it. Historical observations do indicate that individuals removed from European society by Native Americans for too long resist returning to their roots. The Croatoan tribe is widely accepted as a potential link to the colonists, particularly because it was the one word that was left behind on Roanoke Island. Another intriguing idea was that the colonists, faced with uncertainty and challenges in the New World, attempted to sail back to England themselves. Not the wisest thing to do, given the unpredictability of the weather, but you can also see why they might have considered the idea. The theory centers on the small sailing boat, called a pinnace, left behind by the 1587 expedition. This was a smaller vessel capable of transatlantic voyages. Now there are a number of different things that could have happened here the colonists might have opted for a direct course to England to avoid the risks of the standard route across the Atlantic, which involved a stop in the Caribbean. The Spanish attacks were still going strong thanks to their opposition to English colonizations in the region, so the colonists couldn't risk stopping anywhere. 
It's also possible that the pinnace was not large enough to carry all 117 colonists, so it could only accommodate a select group. So even if they were successful in leaving the island, no one would know what happened to the ones left behind. Adding to that, the lack of concrete evidence of anyone leaving the island, plus details about the condition of the boat and the colonists' sailing capabilities, made it seem impossible that they'd venture out to sea like that. The next interesting take on this mystery came quite a while later. In 2006, writer Scott Dawson introduced a theory centered around an intriguing artifact, the tree with the word CRO carved into it, similar to the Croatoan inscription found at Roanoke in the initial investigation. According to Dawson, CRO could signify a relocation from Croatoan Island to join the quarry on the mainland near Lake Matamaskeet. It was definitely a good hypothesis, but the theory did end up facing several challenges. The primary issue lay in the interpretation of the CRO inscription as a deliberate message from the colonists. People argued that the faint marking could be a result of natural processes, like tree growth, weathering, or even unrelated human activities. Possibly a random carving that had nothing to do with the missing settlement. So the lack of explicit evidence connecting the inscription to the colonists' intentional communication raised doubts. But that's not all. A study was conducted in 2009 regarding the tree's age, and the results were inconclusive, which added another layer of uncertainty. A detective came and knocked on the door. And I said, is it Renee? And he just gave me that solemn look. It was the worst day ever. The Proof Podcast is back with a new case and a new season. 23 years ago, 18-year-old Renee Ramos went missing. Her body was later found in an empty Home Depot building on the edge of town. I don't think that they arrested the right people. It's about time somebody's trying to do something. She had a black eye about two weeks before she was murdered. They are involved. They definitely had her body and her backpack. You know people are going to judge you, right? Of course. They're judging me now. They've been judging me damn near my whole life. You can listen now to Season 2 of Proof wherever you get your podcasts. And follow along with us as we reinvestigate the murder at the warehouse. I have to ask, did you kill Renee? American Criminal is a new true crime podcast from the studio behind American Scandal and American History Tellers. Every week, you'll fall deeper into the riveting stories of the country's most clever, craven, and cruel criminals. Fraud, theft, murder, and worse. Whatever the case, whoever the criminal, you don't know the whole story until now. The debut season tackles one of the most sensational cases of the 20th century, the Menendez murders. In 1989, young Lyle and Eric Menendez brutally shot their own parents. Prosecutors and the press said it was a multi-million dollar inheritance that led two greedy rich kids to murder. But the picture-perfect facade this Hollywood family built hid troubling abuse. Could these teenagers have been driven to kill? Or was it even in self-defense? Listen now. Go to AmericanCriminal.com or search for and follow American Criminal wherever you get your podcasts. And then came the Dare Stones. During the years 1937 and 1941, a series of inscribed stones were discovered, apparently written by Eleanor Dare, the daughter of John White. These stones told of the travelings of the colonists, and their ultimate deaths. But a majority of historians today believe these are fake. Only the first stone is sometimes regarded as genuine and different from the rest, based on linguistic and chemical analysis. This makes it one of the two only pieces of evidence directly linked to those of the colonists, the first being the carving of the word Croatoan. But let me stop here and ask you, did you notice what is missing from this list of speculations? 
the thing that pretty much defines a mystery is conspiracy theories, and we've learned quite a few already, but we haven't yet stepped into the truly bizarre theories yet. Because any unexplainable, odd incident with widely disputable answers is eventually forced into one box. Aliens. That's right. Some speculated that the colonists vanished due to mass abduction by extraterrestrial beings. The absence of any bodies fuel this theory because if anyone on the island died of starvation, you would still find their remains there. Of course, there was nothing to support this particular theory, but it didn't stop speculations from running wild. In another rather unconventional twist, some people also proposed that the colony succumbed to a zombie plague, that a sudden undead outbreak could swiftly wipe out an unprepared community. The island's isolation would have confined the infections to its shores. While most dismiss this as fiction, this theory surprisingly gained some support from Harvard archaeologist Lawrence Stagger, who claimed that there are instances of people turning to cannibalism in situations of drought or starvation. Whether it's a plausible idea or a conspiracy theory, they remain to be ideas, adding layers to the enduring mystery of Roanoke. But the absence of conclusive evidence has kept the true answer of the Roanoke mystery to be elusive, lost in the pages of history. Still, research into the mysterious disappearance has continued to move through different phases, with new interests and methodologies employed over the years, like using trees to understand the climate years ago. In 1998, climatologist David W. Stahl and archaeologist Dennis B. Blanton conducted a significant study using bald cypress tree rings. The focus of their research was on tidewater, where the Roanoke colony was located during the crucial years between 1587 and 1589. The result of their analysis brought forward a new revelation. An extreme drought had gripped the Tidewater area during this period. The tree rings, like historical records embedded in nature, indicated that the years between 1587 and 1589 experienced the worst growing season in 800 years. What makes this discovery particularly intriguing is its correlation with historical records. It aligns with the concerns expressed by the Croatoan, the Native American tribe associated with the Roanoke colonists. The first colony foundation in 2011 discovered patches on White's 1585 map and later named a potential location, Site X. Excavations in 2017 found Tudor pottery and weapons, suggesting a small group of colonists. The challenge is distinguishing the origins of these artifacts. Later in 2019, plans for further research in the Salmon Creek State Natural Area were announced, showing the continued interest in the matter. But things have not been easy for those who are trying to solve this mystery. Despite considerable technological advancements, since the disappearance, the mystery is no closer to being solved than it was. So why is it so impossible to find the answer to this? The fact is that archaeologists face a considerable challenge in distinguishing artifacts from the 1587 colony from those of the 1585 outpost or items traded with Native Americans. To definitely link those items to the lost colony, they need something way more concrete, like buried remains of the colonists, which of course are still missing. Another obstacle here is shoreline erosion. The northern shore of Roanoke Island has lost 928 feet of land between 1851 and 1970. Extrapolating this trend to the 1580s, suggests that parts of the settlement might now be well underwater, so any signs of life or artifacts are lost with it. But the research continues, 
and the interest grows. After this mysterious disappearance, artists have been inspired to make movies, novels, and other content inspired by it. In the 1605 comedy play Eastward Ho, the lost colonists were humorously imagined to have intermarried with Native Americans, creating a whole country of English people. Then there was the mention of the 1587 colonists in George Bancroft's A History of the United States. It emphasized Raleigh's nobility and the tragic loss of the colony, and it captured the public's imagination. The term the lost colony first appeared in Eliza Lansford Cushing's 1837 historical romance, Virginia Dare, or The Lost Colony. Virginia was the name of John White's granddaughter, and she was the first child born in the settlement. The 19th and early 20th centuries saw a surge in popularity for the lost colony in Virginia Dare, aligning with debates on immigration and race. Today, Virginia Dare is part of the American myth and folklore, representing things like innocence, purity, new promise, and hope but she has also become somewhat of a symbol of white nationalism because for some residents in North Carolina, she symbolizes the desire to keep the region predominantly of European descent. In the 1920s, a group here opposed giving black women the right to vote, saying that North Carolina must remain white in the name of Virginia Dare. The whole tragedy of the lost colony seems to have become something completely different. But we still have internet sleuths and historians working to find answers. Answers that might put some misunderstandings and speculations to rest. No one knows what happened to them in those three years. I can only imagine the fear and hopelessness those people felt. They came to live an exciting life in a brand new world And maybe it went well, but maybe it didn't. The only legacy they left behind was questions. Many unanswered questions. That is it for this episode, friend. Thank you for listening to Hometown History. And be sure to follow along for more stories and mysteries from the past. (laughs) 